out there, President's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I do not have a second relationship. This is Planet America. Hello, I'm John Barron. And I'm Chesda Chidalo. This week, is there a miracle cure for coronavirus? We'll speak to one of the researchers trying to find out. We'll also look at the economic impact of the pandemic and the impact on the presidential primary. The week began with a grim warning from the US Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams. This is going to be the hardest and the saddest week of most Americans' lives, quite frankly. This is going to be our Pearl Harbor moment, our 9-11 moment, only it's not going to be localized. It's going to be happening all over the country, and I want America to understand that. But there was also a glimmer of hope from the epicenter of the pandemic, New York. Number of deaths uh, are up once again, number of people we lost number of New Yorkers, 4,758, which is up from 159, but which is effectively flat for two days. While none of this is good news, uh, the flattening, possible flattening of the curve is uh, better than the increases that we have seen. Unfortunately, just a glimmer of hope, John, because uh, New York experienced another spike in deaths today. That's the last five days there. Hopefully the daily deaths are close to reaching their peak. Certainly daily COVID cases appear to have settled a little in New York, but they may not be done rising yet either. More important than overall cases though, New York's daily hospitalizations are trending down and the daily intensive care unit admissions are falling rapidly. Now that is the best news of all. Just in the nick of time, because the New York crematoriums were so overwhelmed by the death toll, they've been operating 24 hours a day. And the hospital supplies have been running so short that New York has been paying 15 times as much for masks, twice as much for infusion pumps, and 250 grand for a 30 to 80 grand x-ray machine. And spare a thought for the states that can't afford those prices, by the way. Now, of course, COVID could easily go on a tear again. This is what a peak hour subway car looked like in New York late last week, but New York may be beginning to turn the corner. It's not just them. If we look at the last five days nationally, America's new cases have stayed steady in the low 30,000s per day. Unfortunately, the daily deaths are still on their way up in a big way, but they tend to be a trailing indicator. So anyway, they're now at almost 2,000 per day. In a positive sign though, the Boffins' projections are improving. The IHME model, which the White House often refers to, just this week lowered its projected total deaths up to August from 93,500 deaths down to 81,700 deaths. A 12,000 life upgrade isn't bad in a week. And we can also see these trends playing out on the state level. Most of the states today in the green zone have about the same number of new cases as they did five days ago in the pink zone. Although once again, from the pink zone to the green zone, the numbers of new deaths in a number of places is still rising. And there are also some hot spots. See Georgia, for instance, popping up on the bottom there. I suspect we'll be talking more about that next week. There's also a local hot spot in New Orleans, which currently has a COVID death rate per capita that is double that of New York City. And it has a particularly vulnerable population because 78% of COVID patients in intensive care have underlying health conditions conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease or lung disease. And New Orleans residents are amongst the worst in America for diabetes, high blood pressure and obesity. There are a lot of poor people in New Orleans as well. And poor people, generally speaking, can't work at home as much, are much more likely to live in crowded areas. They use laundromats, catch public transport. They're less likely to get home deliveries. So social distancing is more difficult for them. And when they do get sick, they're less likely to have health insurance. Of course, health and financial issues play into racial disparities as well. So African-Americans account for 70% of all Louisiana COVID deaths when they only make up 32% of Louisiana's population. 
Now to testing. In America, is up to 150,000 new tests being conducted a day. I did mention last week there'd be about 50,000 more fast tests this week. Well, there they are. Unfortunately, the testing is not being distributed equally. If you look at the COVID-10 states, New York has tested over twice as many people per capita as South Korea has. And so is Louisiana, Massachusetts and New Jersey. They're doing well as well. But Illinois, Michigan, California and the new worry zone, Georgia, are still way under tested. We simply don't know the true COVID picture in those states. In California, it's even worse than it appears because while 86,000 tests had been conducted as of a week ago, only 28,000 results had actually been delivered. Twice as many results were stuck in a backlog. Seems appropriate for California. So it's fair to say one month after this promise from Trump, anybody right now and yesterday, anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test and the tests are beautiful. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We're not quite there yet, but they are getting closer. The next problem, John, is that one in three people who have the virus seem to be getting negative test results. But one problem at a time, John. Yeah, well, one problem the White House has fixed in the last 24 hours, Chaz. The communications shop has had a bit of a clear out. The uh, press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, has been given the boot after nine months in the job, a time in which she delivered exactly zero press conferences. Oh. She's been replaced by former Fox News host and Trump campaign spokesperson Kayleigh McEnany, who seems perfect for the job. We will not see diseases like the coronavirus come here. We will not see terrorism come here. And isn't that refreshing when contrasting it with the awful presidency of President Obama? She's going to be great. Meanwhile, President Trump continues to encourage the use of the anti-malarial drug hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for COVID-19. Despite some concerns, it's unproven, even dangerous. And reports that he has a financial stake in Sanofi, the company that makes the drug chairs. Yeah, yeah, although we should say that it's his family trust that have bought a stake in a mutual fund that has bought a stake in Sanofi. So it's kind of six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Yeah, it sounds completely above board. <laughs> An entire coincidence and not at all corrupt either. Uh, particularly that he's just bought 29 million doses of this drug on a hunch. I, I want them to try it and it may work and it may not work. But if it doesn't work, it's nothing lost by doing it, nothing. We don't have time to go and say, gee, let's take a couple of years and test it out and let's go and test with the test tubes and the laboratories. We don't have time. He's certainly not lost anything. Reporters tried to draw medical advisor Dr Anthony Fauci into that debate, but the president shut it down. And would you also weigh in on this issue of hydroxychloroquine? What, what do you think about this? And what is, the, what is the medical evidence? That question? Yeah. Well, I, I Maybe 15, the doctor. 15 times. Okay. You don't have to ask He's, the he's your medical expert, <laughs> correct? He's answered that okay. question 15 times. And here's one of those 15 times a week ago. Today, there has been some promise with hydroxychloroquine, this potential therapy for people who are infected with coronavirus. Is there any evidence to suggest that, as with malaria, it might be used as a prophylaxis against COVID-19? No, the, the answer is is no. And, and the, the evidence that you're talking about, John, is anecdotal evidence. Still, the president has seen enough evidence to convince him that this drug, which is approved for use for a number of diseases, is worth a shot. And Dr Fauci says he wants to see the results of clinical trials, but he does accept that it is now up to doctors if they want to prescribe it in the meantime. Over on Fox News, anchors like Tucker Carlson claim that the media is talking down this drug for purely partisan reasons. Just to let you know unequivocally and for all time that the media lied about a potential therapy to defeat this disease and save your life because they're political partisans. That tells you everything you need to know. And Tucker's medical contributor, Dr. Mark Siegel, has a good feeling about hydroxychloroquine. I can't prove to you that it works at this point, but it's extremely right. promising, and there's a lot of evidence that it does work. But also on Fox News, Dr. William Hazeltine, a pioneer in HIV and AIDS research and the Human Genome Project, had this to say. We know that at very best, this drug will have a very mild effect on changing the course of the disease, if it has any effect at all. It is irresponsible to promote this drug at this time. 
well, he won't be back. Mm. But uh, there is a lot of confusion about chloroquine's effectiveness out there. Every day there seem to be more doctors on TV swearing by it. But a small clinical trial just this week found hydroxychloroquine did not appear to help the immune system clear the coronavirus. Even worse, a Swiss trial had to be called off because of chloroquine's side effects were too severe. Having said all that, 4,000 seriously ill COVID patients in New York are currently being given chloroquine under close supervision. So we should find out one way or another in the next few weeks if there's anything to it, even if it's not a formal clinical trial. Yeah, or even if it is, because in fact a team of researchers is working right now to try and find out whether hydroxychloroquine is effective in treating COVID-19 or not. Dr Ruan Barnabas is an Associate Professor of Global Health at the University of Washington and Principal Investigator for this study. Dr Barnabas, thank you very much indeed for taking time out to talk to Planet America. Thank you so much for having me. Can you explain to us in, I guess, simple terms, how do you test something like chloroquine to see if it works in treating COVID-19? So we are testing whether hydroxychloroquine can work to prevent COVID-19, specifically whether if someone is taking hydroxychloroquine, they, are, they don't develop disease after having close contact with someone who has COVID-19. So participants who are close contacts, so either you live in a household with someone who has COVID-19 or you are a healthcare worker who has spent time looking after a patient without protective personal equipment uh, are enrolled in the study and half of them receive hydroxychloroquine and the other half receive a control medication. And we follow these participants who are well and without symptoms when they enroll in the study to see if any develop COVID-19 over the course of the study. And if hydroxychloroquine works, we'll see a fewer cases among people who receive the hydroxychloroquine. That's how we will be able to test scientifically whether this works or not. And doctor, how long do you think it will be before you have the results of your study? We're working as quickly as possible um, and we hope that we will have the results early in the summer. Given there are a, a series of known risks and side effects uh, to taking this particular drug. In your view, is it a, as the president says, well, you've got nothing to lose, it's a, it's a risk worth taking for those people who are seriously ill, or should people be waiting? One of the nice things about hydroxychloroquine is that it is relatively safe. We have uh, evidence from it being used for years in people who have autoimmune diseases, including lupus. We know that it can be used safely among older people. There are some side effects. But for us, the real risk benefit here would be to determine whether or not there was, whether this actually worked to prevent infection. We have heard that uh, that as little as double the regular dose uh, can even be fatal in, in some cases and uh, that blindness, heart problems, all sorts of things that sound pretty scary uh, are out there. H has that danger been overhyped, do you think, or is it appropriate? So it definitely depends on each person who's taking the medication. If someone has existing heart rhythm abnormalities, if they have some other, if they're taking other medications that interact with hydroxychloroquine, or if they have severe allergies, for them it could be particularly um, dangerous. And so th that you would just need to start that sort of medication in conjunction with talking to your doctor who could review your specific health needs and your other medications. That must be a particularly difficult situation given that it is people with underlying health conditions such as those you've mentioned which are mm -hmm. at most risk of ending up uh, in ICU and on ventilators. Absolutely. So that's why it's absolutely critical to have evidence that hydroxychloroquine actually works because if it does work we can mitigate some of those drug interactions. We could change medications. We would know uh, we would be able to better understand the risk benefit. We could um, help, we could deal with the allergic reactions in different ways, but we, it must be driven by the knowledge that this is actually something for which the benefit outweighs the risks. Doctor, you mentioned that lupus sufferers already take chloroquine, and I believe rheumatoid arthritis sufferers also take it as well. Do you know if there are many lupus sufferers and rheumatoid arthritis sufferers who are getting COVID? Because that would be the easiest way of seeing the effectiveness of, of chloroquine, wouldn't it? If none of them are getting COVID, then that's a sign. Yes. So that's an excellent question. I know that other people are looking at that. And indeed, several people have emailed me to ask that. 
Um, I, I know that other studies are looking at their looking at their data. So hospital systems could look to see if patients who are on on hydroxychloroquine uh, develop COVID and if that's different from other people. Thank you for being with us. Yes, thanks so much for having me. Last week, we talked about fears for the safety of America's 2.3 million prisoners, including those on New York's notorious Rikers Island, 85% of whom haven't been convicted of any crime. Many are just unable to post bail. Well, this week, the first Rikers inmate died of COVID-19. He was 53-year-old Michael Tyson. He was sent to Rikers in late February for a non-criminal parole violation. And it's not just prisoners at risk, of course, it is prison workers too. According to the New York Times this week, on the weekend, 273 inmates, 321 correction staff and 53 health workers had tested positive to the virus. Four correction staff have now died. And nobody thinks that they're at greater risk than the prisoners, by the way. They just have a greater chance of being tested. And note, by the way, 200,000 people cycle in and out of the nation's jails every week. So that is an excellent way to spread a disease. Introducing the Coronavirus Classic Cinema Collection. Wonderful films remastered for the social distancing age. The collection includes Stand 1.5 Metres Away From Me, Two Angry Men, When Harry Didn't Meet Sally, Ferris Bueller's Day In, Goodfella, Vanilla Skype, No Weddings and No Funerals, and many, many more. Enjoy your quarantine with these classic films, edited for the current times. Out. Up, 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 up. They said you might be up here. No, thank you. I'm fine right here. To the large egg, return to your home. After I'm exercising. Make them yours while stocks and humanity last. Big, beautiful words. Now, for the last few weeks, we've been telling you about just how bad the unemployment situation in America is. The initial unemployment claims went from there to there. And then they went to there. Add those two weeks together, you got 10 million jobs lost. That's more than the 8.7 million jobs lost for the entirety of the Great Recession. And if that's not clear enough, well, this was that first bump of unemployment in Louisiana two weeks ago. And this was the week Hurricane Katrina hit. Okay, so the unemployment there, that's bad. <laughs> we get that? Then you had the official unemployment rate come out for March. And that went from there all the way up to there. Oh, is that all? Well, that's... Not so bad, is it? So I guess that's the segment then. Big, beautiful. No, of course that's not the segment. These segments never work like that. I'm going to be up here raving until you look like this. Yes. So why has that unemployment rate there remained so low? Well, firstly and most obviously, this number here is not actually the unemployment rate from the end of March. The household survey that number there is based on actually only pertains to the week from the 8th of March to the 14th of March. And do you remember what happened that week? Not very much. Here's your big jump in unemployment and here's when the survey was conducted. So when you see this graph here showing how many jobs were lost in the March unemployment figures, remember that there is just the tip of the iceberg. And by the way, that was the Great Recession at about the same level as that tip of the iceberg. But even if we did have a 100% up-to-date unemployment rate, and according to Gallup's data, that rate would be at about 7% at the end of March, that is still a gross underestimate of the economic damage because unemployment rates only count those who are looking for work. So even though Gallup reckons about 46 million people have either lost their jobs or had their hours reduced because of COVID, they say about 18 million of the unemployed people will not be counted as officially unemployed because they're not 
actively looking for work, which kind of makes sense because they're in isolation, aren't they? But that 18 million people also need to get their jobs again before America is back to where it was. Okay, but even if you did have up-to-date numbers and you counted all those 18 million unemployed people, things are still worse even than that. Because this may look bad, and it is, but the people getting sacked then is not over yet. These are all the states that passed stay-at-home orders since March 28. That's 16 states there, and there's some pretty big states as well. You've got Florida, you've got Texas, you've got Georgia. They've got a lot of people. There's 137 million people in total there, many of whom are also about to lose their jobs. And the longer this thing drags on, the more people are going to get sacked. Remember, only 34% of American jobs can be performed at home, which accounts for about 44% of total wages. So, that is a lot of sacked people eventually, especially given the coronavirus is laser focused on the most productive parts of the economy. Out of about 3,100 counties, the 100 most affected corona counties generate 51% of America's output and 44% of all its jobs. So this is pretty dire, but there is one silver lining. Now bear in mind, this is just the tip of the iceberg, okay? But so far, the number of permanent sackings is not very large. That's them there. The vast majority of sackings so far are temporary layoffs. These ones here. Now, usually when someone gets laid off temporarily, that's a euphemism for get lost. But in this case, they may well actually get those jobs right back. In fact, 64% of those temporarily laid off say it's very likely that they will be able to return to their old job after the crisis is over. So hopefully that will lead to a big bounce back. Hopefully. That's it. There. That wasn't so bad, was it? Excellent! The coronavirus pandemic has thrown what was already an unpredictable presidential primary into complete disarray. After his big comeback in late February and early March, Joe Biden's march towards the nomination has basically stalled, with the postponement of primaries in Ohio, Georgia, Puerto Rico, Alaska, Hawaii, Louisiana and Wyoming. A number of other states have now put off their ballots or opted for mail-in elections instead. Today was the Wisconsin primary, a crucial swing state that Bernie Sanders won over Hillary Clinton in 2016, but he's been trailing Biden in recent polls. And after weeks of political and legal wrangling, yesterday Wisconsin's Democratic Governor Tony Evers called off in-person voting, saying it was just too risky. But it didn't end there. Republican legislators mounted a legal challenge immediately. And within five hours, a conservative majority on the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled the governor didn't have the authority to postpone elections. So polls will open at 7 a.m. tomorrow as planned, despite major shortages in poll workers due to many older volunteers staying in isolation. And so it was on. And you just knew it was going to be perfectly safe to vote in person because the Speaker of the State Assembly, Robin Voss, said so. You are incredibly safe. To go out. I am now completely reassured, John. Feeling good. <laughs> but let's face it, this primary was kind of farcical. Normally there'd be 180 polling locations in Milwaukee, but today they can only staff up five of them. And they needed the National Guard to even do that. Now, sure, in a pandemic, you'd expect more absentee votes. And that is how it turned out, with over 1.2 million absentee ballots requested, over 50% more than for the 2016 general election. But there was a little hidden trap there, with state law requiring all absentee votes to be signed by a witness. A little bit tough if you live alone and you're meant to be socially distancing. But I guess in a situation like this, there are no good options. Maybe no good options, Chaz, but certainly some better options like letting people vote without risking their lives. <laughs> Earlier in the week, Vice President Biden said the Democratic Convention, which has already been pushed back a month to mid-August, is going to be very different. Well, we're going to have to do a convention, may have to do a virtual convention. I don't I think we should be thinking about that right now. 
the idea of holding the convention is going to be necessary, but we may not be able to put 10, 20, 30,000 people in one place, and that's very possible. Very possible indeed, and Biden says that they have to start planning for a very different kind of election come November too. But I think it's time we start thinking about how we're going to hold elections, whether we're going to have to and spend a lot of time figuring whether we do it. Is it going to mostly be by mail, which is not the preferred route for everyone? For his part, President Trump has been suggesting Joe Biden's actually quite happy to be in hiding, avoiding campaigning against Bernie Sanders because of the pandemic. And this week he was stirring that pot. Joe Biden wanted the day for the Democratic National Convention moved to a later time period. Now he wants a virtual convention, one where he doesn't have to show up. Gee, I wonder why. And then he added... Also, whatever happened to that phone call, he told the fake news he wanted to make to me. Well, it turns out Joe did call yesterday. We just had a very friendly conversation. Uh, lasted probably 15 minutes. And uh, it was really good. It was really good. Hmm, that's a bit of a surprise. We'll see how long that lasts. Next week, we're going to be talking to the man Joe Biden describes as his best friend, former Senator Chris Dodd. What does he make of this crazy presidential campaign? We'll find out next Wednesday night. Well, actually, there is at least one thing it's good for. History shows wars really help a president win re-election, which helps explain why no election has ever been stopped by a war or anything else. In 1864, during the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln was easily returned over George McClellan. Abe helped by the fact that slaveholding states had seceded and couldn't vote. There was no US election in the First World War, but in 1944, during the Second World War, President Franklin Roosevelt stood for an unprecedented fourth term. FDR's first outdoor appearance as a campaigning candidate. He doesn't seem to mind the weather one bit. New York certainly knows there's a political campaign on. The tide of war had turned that June when Americans led the reinvasion of Europe. Roosevelt's presidential rival, Tom Dewey, did not have a chance. It's clear that Mr. Roosevelt has been re-elected for a fourth term and every good American will wholeheartedly accept the will of the people. In 1972, during the Vietnam War, President Richard Nixon was easily returned against George McGovern. Thanks for making our last campaign the very best one of all. In 2004, even as the Iraq and Afghanistan wars bogged down, President George W. Bush won again over John Kerry. I'm humbled by the trust and the confidence of my fellow citizens. And while war was less of an issue in 2012 than the economy was, a military surge and the killing of Osama bin Laden helped Barack Obama win a second term. We have picked ourselves up. We have fought our way back. And we know in our hearts that for the United States of America, the best is yet to come. No incumbent president has lost an election during a major war. Although twice, presidents who could have run again didn't because things were going badly on the battlefield. I do not feel that it is my duty to spend another four years in the White House. By 1952, Harry Truman had been president already for seven years. He'd inherited the presidency from Roosevelt just weeks before the end of the war in Europe. President Truman announced the official surrender. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. Truman was elected in 1948 and eligible to run again four years later, but by then the war in Korea was going badly. America was looking for a new wartime leader and they found it in former Allied Supreme Commander General Dwight Eisenhower. Half a million people crowd the streets as Ike tours downtown Washington for half an hour on his way to the White House. At the height of the Vietnam War in 1968, Lyndon Johnson, who, like Truman, had come to office following the death of his predecessor, was also eligible to stand again. LBJ faced a primary challenge from fellow Democrat Eugene McCarthy. Johnson decided he couldn't be both president and candidate. I do not believe that I should devote an hour or a day of my time to any personal partisan causes or to any duties other than the awesome duties of this office. 
He announced he would not run and Vice President Hubert Humphrey narrowly lost to Eisenhower's Veep, Richard Nixon. We'll never know if LBJ could have won. Wartime presidents who do stand for re-election benefit from a national mood to stay the course and rally around the flag. Little wonder then that President Trump is casting himself in that role today. I'm a wartime president. It's a war. We're at war. In a true sense, we're at war. It's going to be a tremendous day when we win this war, and we will win the war. I view it as a, uh, in a sense, a wartime president. I mean, that's what we're fighting. Out of context at the COVID-19 briefings. Trump explains what people can expect from a post-quarantine Splendor in the Grass music festival. You will see drugs being used like nobody's ever used them before. The president is skeptical of the dog makeovers on Pooch Perfect. Somebody should probably look into that because I just don't see from a practical standpoint how that's possible to go from that to that. And the commander-in-chief sets a price for a Planet America appearance. This room would have to be filled up five times with hundred dollar bills, okay? That was Out of Context at the COVID-19 briefings. And that is it for another trip to Planet America. We will be back next Wednesday, 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, have a happy Easter and stay well. We will not be doing a fireside chat on Good Friday or the following Friday, but there will be Planet Extra podcasts for all the stuff we don't get to cover. We just put one up right now. See you there. Happy Easter. Bye-bye.